I want to jump right into this word today. This is um, the first Sunday of the year, and uh, we, we are operating under the auspices of a new theme for the year, uh, divine establishment, and we're going to build that out. So grab your Bibles and join me in the book of Acts, chapter number two, the book of Acts, chapter number two. Again, we welcome all of you. Don't leave me just yet. Don't leave me just yet. Stay, stay with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're still mad. I need you to play until the spirit, the evil spirit is lifted off the room. <laughs> Acts chapter number two. Again, I, I don't know if I said this earlier. I kind of just jumped right into the announcements, but we welcome everybody. We're so glad to have you with us. Um, it, it is our honor that you've chosen to worship with us today, whether you're in person or whether you're in our e-community. Uh, uh, again, Acts chapter number two. Uh, last thing I'm gonna say before I jump into this word is I have to celebrate my wife, uh, Lady Tanya. Today is her birthday. And, and we celebrate her today um, she is however many years old she is, and, and uh, it, it, don't, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. Um, and I, I've, I've told her this in private, and, and I believe that it's, it's important for me to say this in public. Um, and I tell you all, other than the Holy Ghost, other than the gift of that God has given us, which we're going to talk about today, my wife is literally the greatest gift that God has ever given to me. And I am absolutely grateful for her. Um, I love her dearly. This year, last year, whew, I can say that, last year was, um, was a trying year in a lot of ways. And um, it is really through tests and trials that you find out the depth of your relationships. That you want to know who you want to know who you really got, go through something. And you'll discover who is with you, who is for you, who is on your side, and who are just the hangers on. Amen? Um, so, so I'm grateful for her. Acts chapter number 2. Just two verses in your hearing, verses 17 and 18. And again, I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. And here's what the word of the Lord would say to us. And it shall come to pass in the last days, God declares that I will pour out of my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, telling forth the divine counsels. And your young men shall see visions, divinely granted appearances. And your old men shall dream divinely suggested dreams. Yes, and on my men servants also, and on my maid servants in those days, I will pour out of my spirit, and they shall prophesy telling forth the divine counsels and predicting future events pertaining especially to God's kingdom. That's more than enough reading, is in, and we'll get some more out of, in, in the context of Acts chapter number two. Uh, most of the time, we, you know, we, we touch this text when, with regard to the, you know, the day of Pentecost and things of that nature, 50 days after uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. But... We're in this series called Basic Training. And uh, I, I want to, if, if we can, walk through over the course of the next few weeks some of our more foundational truths that we need to unpack. Um, over the next few weeks, we'll be, we will be establishing or rather reestablishing our understanding of the foundational tenets of our faith. Again, our theme for this year is divine establishment. And this year, we're going to discover, uncover, and recover the truths concerning our foundations. This year, hear me, God is going to establish, settle, and perfect us. First Peter 5 and 10 says, 
in the Amplified Version that God will make us what we ought to be. Say that again. God will make us what we ought to be. Somebody didn't get it, I'm going to give it to you one more again. That God will make us what we ought to be. Are y'all with me? He, he's not going to make us what we should be or what we could be, hear me, or what they want us to be. He's going to make us according to his will and purpose what we ought to be. And here's the truth. The better the foundation, the greater the structure that can be constructed and built up. So over the, the course of this, especially for this month of January, we're going to deal with our foundational truths. Are y'all with me? Y'all all right? All right, cool. Thank you, Corey. So, so watch this. The, th this first series, again, is called Basic Training. It is, it is foundational in context. Knowing what we believe and why we believe it is crucial. Let me say that again, because this really is the crux of this entire series is this statement. Knowing what we believe and knowing why we believe it is absolutely paramount to our success. Why is that important? Because I'm convinced that we are quickly approaching a time of great evangelism and a time of great revival. Did y'all hear me? Th this year is going to be a year where evangelism is going to be the thing to do. If, if you want to win somebody, this is going to be the year to do it. If your family members are not saved, this is going to be the year where you win your family members. If there are friends who you, you really believe you should be witnessing to, this is going to be the year where you should dig in your heels and believe that part of the mandate of the church, the church grows through evangelism. And through evangelism, hear me, we, we, we're going to win souls, but also I believe that there is a great revival that is going to hit the earth. Now, now y'all got to grab a hold to this. This is important. A great revival is going to hit the earth. Revival is not just a coming alive again. But one of the definitions, I believe it's in the Greek, of revival is uh, to, to, to be put back in your proper place. To be put back in your proper place. So again, I'm convinced that this is going to be a year of evangelism and revival. And if we're called to win the loss and recover those who have walked away, we must have a cogent understanding of our faith system. We need to know what we believe. We must have a keen awareness of who God is, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is. I'll say that again. If we're going to win people, you need to know who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. Those three are one. Are y'all with me? One God. The Bible, the, the Bible in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter number six says, but, uh, behold, the Lord our God is one God. So we understand we serve one God, but there are different manifestations of God. And, and when you understand who God the Father is, God Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, it is important to understand why these things exist, why these, these manifestations of God exist, especially because the Holy Spirit is vital to our living right. The Holy Spirit is vital to our existing right. The Holy Spirit is vital to our loving right. The Holy Spirit is vital even to our worshiping right. Truth of the matter is, we need the Holy Spirit probably more than we acknowledge. Probably more than we know. And in that regard, I, I want to have this conversation about the Holy Spirit. He, not it, is, is the gift of God to the earth. The Holy Ghost is not it. The Holy Ghost is he, is a he. Now, th this is important. God is spirit. And when we're introduced to God in Genesis, it is clear that God is not a man. Man is a six-day creation, so man is not God. 
Are y'all with me? And, and, and I know it's like, are you really going to slow walk us like this? Yes. Just walk with me for a minute. God is not man. He is spirit. And the Bible says in verse number two of Genesis one that his spirit moved over the face of the waters before he spoke. So we know that God is a moving spirit. And then we know that God is a speaking spirit. Track with me. God's word, God's word left the immaterial world, the spiritual world, and forged the material world so that that which has matter, that which we see and touch and experience and feel, is the result of the Spirit speaking. I, I, I need y'all to grab this. The world exists because God as Spirit spoke. So that that which, is, that which is immaterial formed matter and that which is material. Now watch this. God spoke matter into existence. He spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke the universe into existence, the galaxies, uh, all of those things that currently exist. He spoke them into existence. And the Hebrews tells us that the, 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 the worlds are framed or held in place. By the word of God. Why am I spending this much time on the word? Because I need you to understand that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is a speaking spirit. And when the spirit speaks, something happens. Walk with me. So when God made man in Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, he made man in his image and in his likeness. Right? To look like God in the earth and to operate as God in the earth. Yes? Yeah? Okay, watch this. Then he gave man dominion. Are y'all with me? Now, how did he ensure that the instructions or the function of Genesis 1 uh, was carried out in the manifestation of man in Genesis 2? In Genesis 2, the Bible says he formed Adam from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed into Adam himself. The Bible says he breathed into Adam from in, into Adam's nostrils the ruach of God. And that ruach animated the, the dust and made the dust flesh. And the dust became a living soul. Right? So that when Adam is formed, he gave his function in Genesis 1, gave him form in Genesis 2. When Adam is formed, one of the things that happens is Adam's being is attached to the Spirit of God, right? Then he, he causes Adam to sleep because there's no suitable mate for Adam. And, and from, the, from his side, he takes a, a, a bone, a rib, right? And he makes Eve. Eve and Adam are made of the same substance and they operate from the same force, the Ruach of God. So watch this. When man is created in Eden... Man and woman are created, watch this, in sync with God and his spirit because his spirit is in them. Are y'all with me? So watch this. It, 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 he is not called the Holy Spirit in Genesis. He is called the Ruach, the spirit of God that is breathed into man. The Ruach is the, the, the animating force. It's also a, a term wind. It is a life-giving force. It is the breath of God in man. And this, this is one of the first things that I need us to grasp concerning the Holy Spirit and his operation in the earth. If you're writing this down, if you're writing, write this down. The Holy Spirit is an activator in the earth realm. If you're writing, write it down. The Holy Spirit is an activator in the earth realm. If you want to understand how the Holy Spirit functions, one of the things we have to note is that the Holy Spirit is an activator in the earth realm. Just as the Ruach activated Adam and as the Ruach activated Eve, the same function is what the Holy Spirit does to, to us. Are y'all with me so far? So, the Bible even tells us in the book of Ephesians that we have been made alive again because of the Holy Spirit. 
In Ephesians chapter number 2, we have been revived from the dead. Now watch this. Not physical death, but a spiritual death or a spiritual, hear me, separation from God. Now that separation came as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But watch this. I need to, to make us or help us understand that the Holy Spirit is an activator in the earth realm. So we saw it with Adam and Eve. Yeah? Yeah? Yes? So we start with Adam and Eve, and, and the truth is, you see this truth play out multiple times through Scripture. There are a plethora of people who are empowered by the Scripture, I mean, by the Spirit in Scripture, but the Bible says explicitly that the Holy Ghost is on them, or the Spirit of God is on them. It does not talk about the Spirit of God being in them after the fall of Adam and Eve. This is vitally important, that everyone who is activated in the Old Testament is activated by the Spirit being on them. Now, why is this important? Because if the Spirit is on you, the Spirit can also leave you. So when you were anointed king, Saul, for instance, the Bible talks about the fact that when the oil was poured on him, that the Spirit of the Lord dwelt with him or the Spirit was on him. But watch this. When David was anointed king, he was not king yet. He was anointed to be king in 1 Samuel chapter number 16. The Bible says what? That the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and rested on David for the rest of his life. Are y'all with me? So there is a difference between being, uh, having the Spirit on you versus having the Spirit in you. There was a profound difference. So watch this. The Holy Spirit was on people in the Old Testament. The Holy, Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit was on the prophets. The Holy Spirit was on the kings. And depending on how they operated, it, that, that was the factor that said whether the Holy Spirit stayed on them or was removed. Watch this. But the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is in people. On in the Old Testament, in in the New Testament. There is a unique difference in the operation of the Holy Spirit in us versus the Holy Spirit on us. In John 14 and 16, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper and that helper will be with you forever. So watch this. Look at the difference between a on, off, on, the spirit is on them, the spirit lifted. The spirit is on them, the spirit lifted. Versus in the New Testament, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be with you forever. That once you got God and God got you, there is no way to separate the two. So in other words... In the New Testament context, in our context, the Holy Spirit isn't a momentary empowerment for a season that then lives. He comes to stay forever. And this is a powerful truth as we proceed in this particular dialogue. Once we receive the Holy Spirit, he is there all the time. Somebody say all the time. Say it again like you mean it. Say all the time. So let's look at this because the Bible says that Mary is inseminated by the Holy Spirit and that Jesus was birthed out as a result of that move of the Spirit. In Matthew 1, 18 and Matthew 1 and 20, uh, Elizabeth, Zacharias, Simeon in, in Luke chapter number 2, Mary, John the Baptist, if you read Luke chapter number 1, all of them, the Bible says, are filled with the Spirit. So this is not, I got touched by the Holy Ghost. This is not, I feel something. This is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, do I want to walk down this street this morning? <laughs> okay, I, let, let me just touch on it. The Holy Spirit is a speaking spirit. Yes? Holy Spirit is a speaking spirit. We were taught for many, many years that the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit was tongues, right? You read, read, read Acts chapter number two. 
The Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place with one accord and suddenly there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting and they appeared upon them cloven tongues of fire and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, watch this, and began to speak with other tongues. Not unknown tongues, which is what we term now speaking in tongues, it was other tongues. And that scripture, because it was either not understood or manipulated, one or the other, I'm going to err on the side of not understood. We were taught that you don't have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in unknown tongues. Right? Who, who, who else was taught that? Oh, the vast majority of you are great. Now, here's the problem with that theology. Okay, y'all ready? In Luke, you have Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, John, Simeon, Anna, who the Bible says all of them are filled with the Holy Ghost. None of them spoke in tongues. Not a single one. Now, that's, it's not like a one-off. There's multiple people who have the same experience, but not the outcome we've been taught we're supposed to have. Cool. Y'all don't like those? But that was six, seven people? That's not enough. Okay. On the day of Pentecost, 120 people received the Holy Ghost. Really, 110 because 10 of the disciples received the Holy Ghost 50 days prior. On the day of Pentecost, 110 people received the Holy Ghost, but 120 all had the same phenomena occur. They spoke in other tongues, right? As the Spirit gave utterance. So the utterance of the Spirit wasn't hakamashah. It was known languages, watch this, that correlated to the audience to which the Holy Spirit was sent to evangelize. Uh-oh. So watch this. Not just the six or seven in Luke 1 and 2, but in Acts chapter number 2, 120, none of them spoke in the Hikan Hosha. Not a single one. They all spoke, if you read throughout Acts chapter number 2, they all spoke in known languages. Because the audience was filled with people who spoke those languages. So when they came out of the upper room, the audience was hearing in their native tongues people who had never traveled outside of their region speaking about the wonderful works of God in their native language. And when you talk to people in their language, it's easier for them to comprehend. So the phenomena of Acts 2 is diversity of tongues not unknown tongues. Y'all got it? So, so now, what does this mean? It means that there are multiple manifestations of the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. It means that I can't deny you your experience because it doesn't match my ideology. Oh, y'all don't like this. Because I'm, I'm, I know I'm messing with some of y'all. But I ain't what I was taught. I mean, if you actually read the scripture, it tells you what is actually occurring. Why is this important? It's important because you'll note that the, the Holy Ghost is a speaking spirit. So watch this. Eventually, you're going to say something that is spirit-induced. But in the Bible, it was more like prophecy than speaking in tongues. It was more like, this is going to occur. Word of knowledge, things of that nature that, that did not line up with, I need to hear you speak in tongues and I put the mic at your mouth so everybody in the room can hear you. Because that's, that's what energized the room. They got it speaking in tongues. But what about the people who got it and they danced? What, what, what about the people who got it and they received healing? Mm. What, what about the people who got it and they prophesied? 
I've seen all of these manifestations in, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So part of what we've done is we've told people they didn't have what they received. And then we made them go and seek for what they had. Driving them to a place where they're asking God to give what he gave. And as a result, watch this, people built up a tolerance or animus against God. Because why won't you give me what you say you poured out? So we have to undo this bad teaching so that all of us can actually operate and function in the Holy Spirit doing what he's called us to do, saying what he's told us to say. Y'all all right with that? That was a very long aside, but I think it was necessary. Now, the Bible says that all of these people received the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit. The Bible talks about the fact that Jesus was anointed via the Holy Spirit. And the, the Bible says he was filled with the Spirit in Luke chapter number 4. And watch this. And then it says he was led by the Spirit. So I, I, the, the better litmus for whether or not a person is filled with the Spirit is I just watch them. I mark your life. And see if your life changes as a result of your encounter with God. Because if nothing in you is different, you can't tell me God is in you. If you still cussing folk out like you did the day before you received the Holy Spirit, you need to ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. Because God is not going to tell you to cuss them out. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit will bridle your tongue. The Holy Spirit will, will, will calm you down in moments where you should be angry. The Holy Spirit will make you apologize. Okay, y'all don't want to talk back to me. One of, okay, one of the things that the Bible even tells us about the Holy Spirit, watch this, is that he will, he will enliven the believer, but he will convict the unbeliever. So one of the, well, hear me, one of the signs of the Holy Spirit is your presence makes people change. Your presence makes people rethink their reality. The Holy Spirit, hear me, is an active spirit. Are y'all with me? And some of us are, well, how do I know I have the Holy Ghost? What around you is different? Who, who stops cussing when you come around? Not because you request it, but because the Holy Spirit in you, watch this, is pressing on their spirit. And now they're convicted about what they were comfortable with until you showed up. This is how we know that we have the Holy Spirit. It's not just the huck Messiah and the dancing and the running around the church. Because the truth of the matter is the Bible even tells us that, that Satan and his emissaries will transform themselves into angels of light. They know how to look churchy. They know how to speak churchy. They know how to say the right things. They know how to, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost and you're a devil. So I can't judge whether or not you have the Holy Spirit by how you act in church. Anybody can learn church. Oh, ho, 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 ho. anybody can learn. Do me a favor. Somebody said it with me. Say anybody can learn church. I just saw a video. We was just talking about the TikTok videos. I just saw a TikTok video of a, of a two-year-old hooping and wiping his forehead like he was a preacher. How did he learn it? He watched it. You put anybody in an environment long enough. Guess what they're gonna do? Assimilate. Okay, let me try to get through these notes. Y'all all right? All right, so Jesus, if you read through John 14, 15, 16, 17, he constantly refers to the Holy Spirit as he. Jesus personifies the Spirit to help us gain a better understanding that when he, the Spirit, comes, we should be benefited by a relationship with divine agency in us. Did y'all hear me? That when he comes, we benefit from having the divine agency of God 
on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is God in us. One more time. The Holy Spirit is God, creator of heaven and earth, in us, through Jesus. Y'all got it? So watch this. How does the Holy Spirit operate? The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is, uh, in the Greek, is the word a paraclete, or parakletos. And that word means helper, advocate, comforter, counselor. Are y'all with me? So John 14 and 16, Jesus says, he's sending another helper. So watch this. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit comes to be to the church what Jesus was to the disciples. One more time. The Holy Spirit to the church is what Jesus was to the disciples. Did y'all catch it? So watch this. Who was Jesus to the disciples? He was an advisor. He was a comforter. He was a miracle worker. Stay with me. He cast out demons. In Luke 9 and 10, the Bible says that the, the disciples, the, the, while, while they were being formed into apostles, they went out two by two, and because they were able to use the name of Jesus, they were able to use the agency of Jesus, the power of Jesus. The Bible says they healed the sick, they preached the kingdom, and even the demons were subject to us because we use your name. So watch this. Before the Holy Ghost is poured out, People without the Holy Ghost, I want to be clear, are casting out demons because they had the power and the authority to use the name of Jesus. Are y'all with me? This is Jesus being an advocate while he is still on the earth. So when Jesus departs, when he, is, when, when he dies on the cross, he's buried, and he is resurrected on the third day, his ascension activates the Holy Spirit to be released in the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes into the earth, poured out into the earth, he empowers us to be like Jesus in the earth. So everything Jesus did, he was the example for what we should do as Holy, Holy Spirit-filled believers in the earth. Did y'all catch that? Now, the, the question then that must be asked is, how much of your life mirrors Jesus' walk? If you can't say that your life mirrors Jesus' walk in any facet, you need to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. That was a really pregnant pause. I wanted that to kind of just sit. The paraclete, it, it, it means, that word in the Greek means call to one's aid. One who pleads another's cause before a judge. So the Holy Spirit is an advocate or a lawyer for you. The Holy Spirit is an intercessor. The Holy Spirit is an intercessor. Are y'all with me? So hear me. Real intercessors can't intercede without the Holy Spirit. You can talk a good game, but there is no power. You don't have any authority with the powers without the Holy Spirit. Are y'all with me? Watch this. The Holy Spirit uh, is destined to take the place of Christ with believers, hear me, so that it will, he will lead us into a deeper knowledge of the gospel of truth and give us the divine strength needed to enable us to undergo our trials, our tribulations, and to also be examples of God in the earth. Y'all got it? Yes? So watch this. The, the, the Bible says that, that the Lord will pour out his spirit upon what kind of flesh? What kind of flesh? All flesh. The Holy Spirit is the, is, hear me, the manifestation of the promise that God gave to the earth in Joel 
In Acts chapter number two, the outpour began. So on the day of Pentecost, when they were all filled with the Spirit, and, and they were all with one accord, and cloven tongues of fire appeared upon each of them, the Bible says that, it, or indicates to us rather, that this is that moment in time that God promised hundreds of years before he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. That word pour out means to distribute largely, to gush out. It is the abundant bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. This, this is key. It, it, and again, if, you, if you're taking notes, Romans 5 and 5. Write it down. Romans 5 and 5. Because Romans 5 and 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit is an expression of God's love for us. That God poured out his spirit because he loves us. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is a gift of love to the earth. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you're receiving God's love. Why is this important? Because, because we've made receiving the Spirit such a mystical, mysterious thing. We've actually removed the facet that is most important for us to accept him, which is it is freely given, and, and this gift is given because of love. How many of us would deny a gift given in love? Most of us would not. I dare say all of us would receive a gift given in love. Are y'all with me? So the Holy Spirit is an indicator that God is expressing his love for us. The, the result of the Holy Spirit is the activation of spiritual gifts designed to benefit the world. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And watch this. He says, the first thing that will happen is you will prophesy. You will begin to speak divine oracles. You will declare, watch this, the mind of God in the earth realm. That's what prophecy ultimately is. It is an unveiling of God's mind in the earth realm. He says, you will prophesy, you'll see visions, and you'll, and you'll dream dreams. The young men will see visions, the old men will dream dreams. So watch this. The inference is that God will speak to the church, that God will speak to the saints, and that God will speak to the world in various methods all with the purpose of reconnecting men and, women, men and women back to God. So the Holy Spirit is a reconnector. The Holy Spirit is the agent of revival of the spirit of humankind. Watch this. Back to God's Edenic intent. So all of this is about getting us back to Eden. Are y'all with me so far? Receiving the Holy Spirit is a divine reset to heaven's settings for us. When I receive the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it is God saying, I want you to operate like I intended. In Eden, fellowship with God was automatic. There was a set time, the Bible says, to speak with God for Adam and Eve. The Bible says that they would walk with the voice of the Lord in the cool of the day. Every day they had a meeting time with God. Every day, watch this, they had interaction with God. Every day they heard God speak to them. Every single day. So watch this, the speaking spirit of God had daily encounters with Adam and Eve and they, watch this, they understood then they had a knowing for how to function for what to accomplish, what not to do, and who they were. One more time. Adam and Eve, prior to the fall, had several things. They had an understanding of what their function was. They knew what they were supposed to accomplish. They also knew what they were, what they were not supposed to do. And they knew who they were until the fall. The Spirit of God was in them, and the fall separated them from the intimacy that, th that they had with God and that knowing that they had. The Holy Spirit then was sent from God through Jesus to reconnect the circuit in humankind so that we can know how to function, 
so that we can know what to accomplish, so that we can know what not to do, and so that we can know who we are. Do, 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 do y'all understand this? That the Holy Spirit, watch this, helps us understand what we're supposed to do in the earth. The Holy Spirit helps us understand who we're supposed to impact in the earth. The Holy Spirit also is a constraining force that says you don't belong there. You shouldn't marry them. You shouldn't invest in that. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. You shouldn't go in there. You shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do that. Now, mind you, the, the, what we should not do is not the most important facet of the Holy Spirit, but it is a facet of the Holy Spirit. If you live your life without any constraint, then, I have, then, I, then, then as a pastor and as a spiritual leader, I have to tell you, you may need to ask God to fill you with his spirit. Because some of us are existing with the Spirit on us. And we're satisfied with the Spirit on us because with the Spirit on us, I don't have to comport myself a certain way. But when the Spirit is in me, conviction says, oh, you can't do that. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. This is why we need to accept the gift. I'm done. Of the Holy Spirit. I don't know where Corey is. Come, come and help me. The Holy Spirit is being in the present tense poured out at this very moment. And, and he has been being poured out since the Acts 2 encounter. Our responsibility is to receive him and to let him lead us into truth, into power, and into right living. We receive by faith the Holy Spirit. And we ask him to show us what God intends for us. This is a faith thing. I got one more scripture for you and then I'm done. In John chapter number 7. I want y'all to go with me. John chapter number 7, verse number 37. John 7, verse 37. Watch this. Now on the final and most important day of the feast... Jesus stood and cried in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Listen to this. He who believes in me, who cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. But he was speaking here, watch this, of the Spirit, whom those who believed and trusted and had faith in him were afterward to receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified or raised to honor. So watch this. How do, how do I, because the question is, if we, we talked about receiving the Holy Spirit and walking in the Holy Spirit and operating the Holy Spirit and, and how he operates in us and what he does through us. But the question then becomes, how do I receive him? Because we, we, we preach, Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, this is the end of the sermon and altar call at the same time. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Acts 2.38. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent, be baptized, in the name of Jesus, in water, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Because, watch this, when we make the confession of faith, salvation begins. I can say I am saved at the point of, 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 of my confession, but I'm not filled at the point of my confession. That's something else altogether. So I'm saved, but I need to be filled. Why do I need to be filled? John 3, when Jesus said, except a man uh, or man or woman is born of the water and the spirit, that born means submerged, in, in, inferred is filled with the spirit of God, he or she cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So again, how do I receive him? It's simple. First, you got to acknowledge that you're actually thirsty. He who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Number one, if you're going to receive him, if you really desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to acknowledge that you have that desire. It's a gift, but you must receive it. The Holy Spirit is not going to force himself on you. He's not going to beat you about the head and shoulders. He's not going to hold a gun to your head and say, you better take me. You better take me now. That's not how it works. Jesus says, first, let me know you're thirsty. And the Beatitudes, he says, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Yes? So, first, acknowledge that you're thirsty. Second, come to him. Not to the preacher, not to your mama, not to your dad, because no human has the ability to dispense what only God can. Let me go further. This moment is not even about the altar. Because coming to Jesus doesn't have to happen in a church building. You can come to him sitting on a bus. You can come to him on a beach. You can come to him sitting on a plane. But the first thing I have to do is acknowledge that I'm thirsty. Acknowledge that there is something that I require that can quench me. Got to say I'm thirsty. Number two, you have to acknowledge that you need to come to him. He's waiting. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus invites us multiple times through scripture to come to him. It is not a physical movement. It is a spiritual disposition. Yes? Third, I got to drink. And here's what's key. You can't drink with your mouth closed. You have to open your mouth to receive. Are y'all with me? And I'm not talking about like just, ah, give me the Holy Ghost, ah, I'm not, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I mean that you have to open your heart, open your spirit, and say, God, pour out into me what I know you desire to give to me. If you're in this room today, I'm believing by faith God would not bring us to this place where we're talking and having this discussion about the Holy Spirit and how he operates and functions, who we should be, what we should do, how we should function, what we should not do, what we ought to be. This conversation would not be necessary except God desires to fill somebody today. So first, there may be somebody in the room who has never made the confession of faith. There might be somebody online who has never made the confession of faith. Let me give you the opportunity to, to come into partnership with God. Just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe your word that you died and you rose just for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. And I'll serve you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And listen, just like that, salvation begins. Your journey begins. But this is not the end of the story. I already told you. you Got to be baptized in the water and the spirit. This is a moment. It's a pivotal moment for somebody right now. Here's what I need you to do. I, if you if, hear me, you can say, well, I mean, I feel like I'm in good re relationship with the Lord, but I don't know if I have the Holy Spirit. This is a moment where you have to acknowledge it, come to Jesus, and receive what he has for you. It's so simple. Unfortunately, the church made it hard, and now we have to unteach the bad stuff and reteach it so that we understand God's intention. But it's literally, I'm, I'm inviting you, Father, to pour into me your spirit because I want to be like you. I want to be better. I want to know who I'm supposed to be. I want to know what I'm supposed to I need to know what I shouldn't do. My life has been chaotic because I've been doing it without you. It's not 
difficult. So if we can, and let me tell you something, worship is one of the easiest ways to open up your heart and your mind. Just take a moment and just begin to give God some worship. In whatever mechanism you choose, just ask him. Ask him, Father, fill me. And some of us need a refilling because we've, we've gotten dried out. Last year wore us out. We started draining the tank. Father, fill us again. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence. 